came on for the very last session of the three days. So thank you for being here, and I'm really excited to talk to you guys about um, accessibility and what we're doing to really improve the user experience. Um, and in the context of um, government, this is really important because we need to be sure that our citizens and those who deserve can access and be transparent. And I'm also going to be looking at not just people with disabilities, but also people in elderly populations. Um, and I really grew up, I'm kind of a technology pioneer. I lost my hearing to meningitis when I was eight months old. And I received the very first cochlear implant when I was three. So I've always been very interested in experiences that allow for me to be in the mainstream world. Being like, I don't want to create a separate experience for me. I've always been passionate about experiences that bridge the community and the digital divide. And so that's just something that's really um, embedded in what I do every day because I never want somebody accessing a government site to go to a text-only version because that's a different experience and they're really locked down. And that's something that um, never makes you feel good. And so I just want to be able to do the same thing. And it's a cooler thing to do. I want to do what my big brother did growing up. I want to do the same things. So I just to kind of talk about like some of the things that you may be interested in finding out about the elderly population. Um, the elderly will outnumber those under the age five by 2020. This is a really fast growing segment. And people are becoming more savvy, but they're losing some of their um, motor functions. And um, they would make up 15% of the population. And can you leave out 15% of your vegetables to your website? And that's a pretty significant number. If you get 100,000 vegetables per month, that's, if you do the math, that's 15,000 people who can't get services. And that's something that's really important to think about. Um, and 68% of the baby boomers over the age of 55 have multiple devices. So they're not just using that big PC at home. They're on their iPads. They're on their phones. Even people in rural communities, they may not have a desktop. They may have an iPad because it's more affordable. And so each user experience is going to be consistent across all of these devices. Are the mobile menus responsive as well as on the website and vice versa? So this is something that's really important that we need to be thinking about. Um, and not only are they on multiple devices, are they also accessible? And something that I've been uh, discovering on um, one of the sites I've been working on when you zoom it up to 200%, it creates a mobile menu version. But that mobile menu version wasn't accessible. So those are the kinds of things I have to really think about. And don't just assume because it's responsive, it's going to work and be accessible. So you've got to make sure you cover all the bases. And so one in five Americans have a disability. That, that's a pretty big number. Um, and now, these are people who have hearing loss, who are blind, um, and I just kind of want to illustrate the U.S. map distorted by population. California and Texas and New York being pretty populous. Now, if you think about this, the number of people with disabilities is seven times the total population of New York. That's that one in five number of people. So of those one in five people, are you serving them? Now, I just want to call out, if you um, have a physical disability, like you can't walk, you can still use your website. So that one in five does really include everybody who needs to access the website. That number really is half of them need assistance in accessing your website. Does make, that make sense? So this is 10% of the population we're talking about. 20% of the population in the country have a disability, but half of that number cannot access the uh, visual or cognitive or motor aspect of navigating a website. So this is a pretty big number, 10%. And so, um, so that's something that I need to think about when you have a project manager or a stakeholder saying accessibility is not important, we'll save that to the end. Like, no, it's actually 10%. Of that 100,000 number I need, that 10% of the traffic 
that she's going to have issues accessing the website. Um, and I want to talk about temporarily disabling conditions. Um, my dad had a cerebral hematoma two years ago. He lost his cognitive functions for about a month. And so he couldn't read websites because they were too complicated. And he couldn't use his hands. But after a month, he was fine. And so you would never find, you would never know when you may have a temporarily disabling condition. Think about a 60 year old who falls off of a skateboard and breaks both wrists. Can you still do his homework assignment? and find the social, social studies research if you can't use the mouse. But you can use a keyboard. And so what about the person who had a, had a stroke? So they have to change web experiences. Now color blindness, 0.5% um, of the world's population of women are color blind. That's not significant. However, on the flip side, eight percent of men are colorblind. So eight percent of you guys have color blindness. How many of you know you have color blindness? Do you know about to debunk this stuff? Okay, maybe you just don't know it. All right. Yeah, I want to show you this color blindness simulator. If you're a web, if a company that targets men, like a sports website and they're not using color, colors that are appealing to non-color non blind men, they're leaving people out. So I want to show you this color blindness simulator is great for designers because they get literally a blow comps or even a website URL to this color blindness simulator and you can see um, how it looks for people with color blindness. But I'm going to show you this uh, example on the left. We have one more color colors of these um, pastels. And the red bean color blindness is what you see on the left. I mean, yeah, I think so, on the right, on the left. Um, and then you've got red blind. And then you've got blue blind. So they can't see any blues. And that's important if you have a lot of call to action links with blue buttons. They may not see it. So only going to make sure that the call to action links accessible to, to the most people. So really think about the text that's in them. And then we've got the stereotypical black and white, which is the least common. So I just wanted to call those out because there's a lot of forms and degrees of color blindness out there. And so if you go back, and so I'm going to show you the example of this website that we did um, under color blindness simulations. And um, you can see at the top left, it says normal. And then the different red week, different types of color blindness. I'm going to show a screencast of somebody going through to see how the website looks under different, different simulations. I hope I'm, I'm, I'm going to play this. Oh, there we go. And so, they just normal for red week. You can, still, you can still get most of the information. Same with red blind and then black or white. They're not losing content. So that's something that you may want to look at. It may be hard to see with this resolution. So technology will inter enable independent living, as I alluded to earlier. I want to walk you through this experience I had that was pretty, pretty incredible. Um, I have a cochlear implant, as I mentioned. Without them, I can't hear anything. And so um, last year, they actually broke. And because of that, I couldn't hear. I can't come to work. I can't talk to my family and friends. So I'm pretty isolated. And so I sent an email to the company that provided my cochlear implant to say, hey, my project is broken. I'm going to need a replacement. And can you help me get this sorted? And the response I got was, um, so I went to the contact us for them, and they said, I'm sorry, can you give us a call? I was saying, really? Do you want me to call you? My project is broken, I can't hear you. You don't know the customer. So that was a really kind of a telling experience because as a provider, you need to know the customer. And so I was stunned. 
uh, and so it was a it was a really like a negative experience because I had to text my mom. I'm 34 years old and I still need a mom. And I have to be like, Mom, can you fix this? And um, the company took my independence away from me by saying, call us. They could have done so much more to allow for me to be independent and use the web to get the help I needed. They could have done so much more. And I'm going to walk you through what could have happened instead. Now, my projects are broken and I feel like I can get help. Now, I'm ready for a response. And the response includes multiple follow-ups. They can say, hey, fill out this form and we'll give you the help you need. They can have a chat bot on the website. And they can continue the conversation through email. I highly recommend, as an agency, to reciprocate how the consumer or citizen may reach out to you and don't turn on a different response to them. Just because the phone call may be easier, it may not, be, it may not work for them. So I, I recommend trying to come up with multiple ways for somebody to get in touch with you. And so and they said, hey, we'll get you replacement. Schedule an appointment with us. Another important element because again, I can't hear. So I was able to use the online booking system to schedule an appointment to request um, services. And then I was able to receive confirmation through text message. Again, the receptionist is not calling me to confirm. They are maintaining that uh, textual communication throughout the whole process. Whether it's on, on the web, start on the web, website, they went to email, they went to a booking system, and they an SMS system. So, thankfully, I got it fixed. And my doctor sent me an email follow-up and said, Hey, oh, you hearing better? Everything going okay? So it's really about connecting that whole experience and making sure that I feel heard. So when you think about our citizens, making sure that they feel like they're being taken care of, it's an important element. And, it's, and the community of people with disabilities is very vocal. Like if something goes wrong, in the community, we make it pretty hard on Twitter. Uh, it's pretty active, um, but it kind of works sometimes, you know. So, um, and so thinking about G to P, you know, digital experience is really important. In thinking about baby boomers, we're all getting older. We're not getting younger, unfortunately. Um, so don't care yourself ten years from now. Don't think. It's, it's not important now. We'll fix it later. Not only compounding the problem. If you, if you don't, I love to describe it like a house. You have a beautiful house. You have this beautiful plan to build a house. And you build it. And you've got all the landscaping. You've spent tens of thousands of dollars on landscaping. But you break a leg the day, the day you can move in. And you can't get in the house. And, that, and that's no fun. So you can have to pull out the landscaping and install a new ramp. But what if you just made an, an, um, an accessible entrance in the beginning? It would not cost as much. And so you use existing technologies, like the chatbot. That's not a whole proprietary system. Use what's out there. There's a lot of open source tools out there to make communication easy. Now, I want to talk about emulating the experience. Um, I'm going to do some demonstrations on listening to all text. I hope it has to start playing. I'm going to play this video and there's not going to be anything on the screen. And I want you to come up with a mental picture of what is being said. Image, man washing hands. So, what came to mind? Who is it? Do, do you look like this? Probably not. You probably saw many different interpretations of a man washing hands. Now, that description could be a little bit better to make it more descriptive. Because this is clearly a different kind of message. Now, I wanted to think of an art text like a tweet. Tweet is succinct, packed all into 140 characters or less. For example, male doctor in scrubs, in mask, looks on as he lathers up to his elbows with soap to prep for surgery. I have 20 characters remaining. So, I got a lot of information packed into 120 characters. 
That's word descriptive. Now, context matters. Now, think about why was that image chosen? What is that image trying to communicate? Are they trying to communicate trust, professionalism? In, there's no need to say image of man washing hands. There's no need to say that because the screen reader announces the image. And, but what is the emotional context here? Now, the art text, male doctrine scrubs. Now, scrubs, surgical cap and mask indicate standard of care. If it is a hospital website, they want to convey that this is a safe place to come and they follow the standard of care. And it looks on, means it's observant, it's alert. I hope I'm going to get a doctor who's alert, who's not distracted. Um, he's clearly not like looking sad or anything. And now those up to soap with elbows means it's hygienic, which is something I'm going to want in a hospital if I'm looking for a place to go. Preparation for surgery indicates purpose. So um, now, does that make sense? The context is so important. Now, I want us to take a minute and write our text together. I want you to pull out your phones, and I'm going to pull up the address in a minute, but I want you to describe this image, and we're all going to describe it. Now, if you go to twitter.com and you do backslash C. McNally, there's a link to a Google form when you can literally type in and describe this image, and it'd be fun to see what kind of responses you get. So here's my Twitter right here. Everybody found it, okay? So you can just literally click on this and it'll take you to the form. That's weird. I don't believe I'm not getting any responses. I like to think of thinking hard on this. Alright, you've got some responses. I'll read them out. There we go. Now we're talking. Now, two disaster relief people hugging at a disaster site. A worker hugs to struck homeowner in front of a demolished house. Woman hugs a disaster relief volunteer at midst of the rubble in the wake of an earthquake. Female relief worker absurdly, absurdly hugs survivor of a natural disaster among wreckage. So, you've done, some, you've done some key points here. I forgot to mention that this was for, for an aid website. So you got, the, you got those key points that an aid worker is comforting somebody, meaning that they've responded and they're there to take care of somebody. Two people wearing work gloves, oh, sorry. Um, a woman embraces a disaster relief worker amid terrible destruction. That's a really good text because we actually don't know if, um, if it was a house. Was it a building? Was it a school? So we don't really know where that was. Um, but we know it's a disaster relief person and we know, we can assume that she's the owner of that, of that disaster. So um, these are great responses. So it takes practice and it gets easier. Once you think about the context, once you know the context of the tweet, it makes it so much easier. Um, thanks for doing that. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Now I'm going to do some screen reader demonstrations. How many of you have heard of screen reader before? A few of you. How many of you can follow along? Yeah, no, I don't think so. <laughs> it's, it's hard. And 
It's horrible if that person to listen to a speed reader, but I like to use this listening therapy in practice to see if I can understand the speed reader. It's, it's working. Speed therapy. Alright, now links are really important to make them contextually relevant. So what I mean by that is avoid war this click here. But oftentimes the screen readers will pull up a list of links to news as they scan the site. And if all they hear click here, click here, click here, they're not gonna know what to click on. And what I mean by this is this. This is an example of a site. And it has a lot of read words. Link, link, in link, 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 in it, link, link, link. First steps at link, learn more. Link, 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 learn more. Link, in link, link, learn more. So, do you know what to click on? Department of Communications and Web Content. You are currently on Web Content. Now, another one I like to use is um, somehow getting for the screen reader the title of that link target somehow into the into the link. It can be done with CSS. And there's actually a Drupal module that will actually take, if you see um the more, it will actually more AFP proxies. So they know what they're actually clicking on. Um, so let's listen to it. Meet heading level 2 blank. AFP response on counterterrorism arrangements. The AFP would like to respond to a number of incorrect claims made in news reporting today, Wednesday, 8 March 2017, regarding first, you are currently on text element, inside of web content, link. AFP response on counterterrorism arrangements more. Links menu. Media release. Net worth dollar 324 million C. Now, that's not Meet heading level 2 blank. AFP response on counterterrorism arrangements. The AFP would like to respond to a number of incorrect claims made in news reporting today, Wednesday, 8 March 2017, regarding first, you are currently on text element, inside of web content, link, AFP response on counterterrorism arrangements, more. That made more sense, right? So, and here's another example. Link. Now, this is an example from the... Find link. Read more about find your top driver services online. Read more about grandparents and relative caregivers find support with the Kinship Navigator program. Visit link. Read more about learn how you can help improve the quality of Georgia's waterways. So, this is actually my favorite one. Because you know we're getting ready to do. Find your top driver services online. All right. And here's another example of um, one we did with Atmos Energy. Um, Marks menu. Window spots menu. Links menu. Link. Skip to content. Visited link. Budget.gov.au, Australian Government Department of Tr So, so I thought it was one video. But I hope you, hope you got the, um, the message behind. It's really important to have those things. And I'm about to show you, have you seen a web rotor? They will literally rotate through um, navigation links so they can jump up on the site. So, um, in, ensure that links, in making sure that people know that there are children menu items. This comes up so many times. A lot of times they just say menu link. But they don't know if they can use a keyboard to access children link items. So if you can't see the screen, you don't know there's a mouse over hover. So here's an example of um, the links that we did. At most energy web content. You are currently in a voiceover menu. This is a list of voiceover menu options. To navigate up and down the list, use the arrow keys. To add most energy banner, customer actions navigation, main navigation navigation, main content main, footer content info, main content main. You are currently on a main inside of web content. So you can use those um, navigations to jump up on our site. It's really effective. Instead of making level three link newsroom. Visit our newsroom for our latest press releases, multimedia gallery, and stories from your community. Li um, sorry about that, guys. At most energy, what? So here's another one with the keyboard navigation. Look, navigation list six items. Visit link home one of six. Link parliamentary business two of six. Link bills and legislation one. Last link chamber documents. 
So I wanted to call out two of six, three of six, meaning that they understand the depth of how many links are contained within a grouping. So that gives them an understanding of, like, do I care about how have I reached the full depth of this list, or can I go ahead and skip on? Link, committees, four of nine, link, seven estimates, five of nine, link, statistics. So this is drop down. Link, petitions, seven of nine, link, opening of the four five th parliament, eight of link, records of the parliamentary commission of inquiry, nine of nine, with end of list, visit, link, senators and members, three of six, you link. So that is what makes it so much easier for people to understand the depth and the width of a menu when you have those kind of things context. Because if you can't see the screen, you don't know that they're turned out aims. So that's why having that link list is so helpful. Now, you, hopefully you get it. Now what? Please, don't do this. It's okay. It's <laughs> not the end of the world. You can do this, just take a deep breath. It's really not as difficult as I make it out to be. Um, so I'm going to give you some guidelines on how you can make this possible. Now, Really, just take a step back and identify where you are on a website. What is the main purpose of the site? And work backwards. Is it a transportation website? If it's a transportation website, maybe focus on the mapping capabilities. Maybe focus on making sure that the customer knows how to catch the metro or how to catch the bus. And then identify those touch points. What are those points of interactability, interaction? Um, and then are those interaction touch points accessible? And then think about whether or not a keyboard or a screen reader can interact with those touch points to achieve the purpose. And what is the impact if you could increase that by 10%? And you're going to see even more engagement, better citizens. And when you, when you have that list, that can really inform your next steps. And what I mean by categorizing by interaction, for example, images. And then you can list out all those elements of an image and then figure out what's not working and then what needs to be fixed. And just take an inventory and go from there. Don't try to fix the first thing you see because that very first thing you see may not be the main purpose, purpose of the site. And I like, I created this um, traceability matrix for each standard of Section 508 and the CAC. But nowadays, thankfully, the new Section 508 standards, how many of you have been up to date on that? That's great. So Section 508 was actually started in 1998, and it quickly became outdated. And the web content accessibility guidelines is a lot of best practices by uh, a group of thought leaders they came out with some best practices. And that kind of became the gold standard. And so we not only follow Section 508, but really encourage people to follow the CAG. But now, in, in March 18th, the U.S. Access Board can, came out and said, OK, the CAG 2.0 is the gold standard. Let's follow that. So that made it a lot easier than create all these new standards. So it's now one, which is great. I thought we really like the CAG. It's very easy to follow. Um, and then once you categorize all of those interaction points, prioritize them. And then make the first top of the backlog what you address first. And then stage one, stage two, and stage three. Stage one must have. What is going to make it possible for a blind person to get from point A to B on a transportation website? And then you can go from there to stage two. What are the um, additional element to making compliant is it going to be the about us page. That is not the most critical thing to making sure that a man can get from point A to B. Those additional pages may not be the highest priority and you can address those later. So that could be around the other edges. And then stage three are the enhancements. Are there any things that you can really um, redo? Like can you make a better map? Can you make a better user experience? Can you think about texting alerts? Can you think about making the whole experience better, not just for somebody who's blind, but for everybody else? And put that as an en enhancement in the backlog, but at minimum, do the baseline minimum to make sure it's accessible, and then come around later and really put in that, put in that polish. Um, and as I mentioned, 
um, make a compliance stage two. Um, and I think we just mentioned this. Um, five of a standard and the 255 guidelines incorporate the web accessibility guidelines. So that's nice. Um, and these mechanics, the, the new updated 508 standards must be in place on all federal and state websites by January 18, 2018. So if there's any element of a website that may not be in compliance, now is the time to fix it and, just, and update them by next January, that is the new deadline. Um, so, you know, I, I find all these cautionary tales, so how do you get started? Um, there's a few tools that I want you to, to kind of take a look at. The first one is this amazing tool called Totally, if I said that right. Um, are you, did anybody know what A11Y is? Accessibility. Have you heard the term? It's a numerator. Numerator. Numer so there's 11 letters between A and Y of accessibility. So A11Y. So you'll see that a lot on Twitter, to totally, like internationalization is I-18N. So this is the accessibility version of that. So it's A-L-L-Y, I'm sorry, A-11-Y. But when I first saw it, I thought it was ally. Like, am I trying to help each other out? But no. <laughs> but I'm just stick with my interpretation. To, to eleven y So this is by the Khan Academy, and it's free. And it has a duper model. So the great thing about it is you can add it to the site and it shows up in the bottom left corner with a pair of sunglasses. But you can also do it as a Chrome plugin, like I do when I want to test any website. Um, how it works, there's an example of Weight Watchers. As you can see in the bottom left corner are these sunglasses. Once I turn on that sunglasses in the top right, you can see this gray sunglasses in the top right. I click on it, and the JavaScript shows up. And I literally, I click on images with alt text, and it scans the whole page to check for all images with alt text. And then it calls out the errors. And I can click on it, and this one has no alt text. So that image has no alt text. So that's something for me to flag. And they have these for for other things like contrast. This one I wanted to call out because this one creates a lot of false positives. Now blue and white looks to be plenty of contrast, but what's going on is that a background image. So it's rendering it as white on white. So I don't want you to pull up this tool and be like, oh man, my whole site is not contrast compliant, but to take a look. Because you can see it's white right on white, right, which is not the case. It's, so that's fine. Um, but the cool thing about this tool is for those that are actually not compliant, it actually provides you with a recommendation. They say consider using this color combination to make a pass. So it's pretty cool. Um, actually, I'll do a little live demo if you want, um, because I feel like I've confused people. So I'm going to go ahead and just go to like, um, um, let's see here. I'm going to do Weight Watchers again. Now, uh, I'm going I'm to go here. Okay, and I have my plug-in on the top right. I'm going to click on it. And my sunglasses show up down here. And I'm going to click on contrast. And it shows me the areas that pass. So this is fine. This is good. This is not. So I can click on it. It shows me it has a square of 1.4. And then I can click on it, which is down here. And it has a ratio of 1.4. It should be a 4.5. And it says, hey, you may want to think about using 7B, 775B. And that's something I can send to a designer or a web developer. So, hey, can we use this to this color? And that will make a pass. So that's what that is. And then we've got like link text. There's no problems. It passes everything. Labels. Image dot text. Landmarks. So um, I'm going to go back to the presentation. It's a really great tool. I love it. Um, it. It can also do headings. 
the head instruction, head order, and you can flag whether or not a heading has been skipped. Um, content editors, they're awesome. They're our unsung heroes. They're the ones who can make or break a website. We can make the most accessible website, but it only takes one person to not make it accessible through the WYSIWYG. They may just do click here, click here, click here links. Um, so thankfully, there's a CK accessibility tool that you can put on the CK editor, and it literally checks for accessibility live. And there's this little button um, right there, and they can click on it, and there's a, hey, there's seven errors in this WYSIWYG. The image doesn't have alt text, and you can literally write in the alt text. I can say, okay, this is the monitor of an infographic. And I can type it in and hit click fix, and then push in the alt text, just like that. So which is great. And you can also check for lists, which I thought was really interesting. So this marker, you really should be using um, those lists, like one, two, three, and the bullets for this marker. But just how it's BB to know is part of this grouping. Like what we saw with the menus, they can say, this is item one of six, item two of six, item three of six. But if you only put in one parenthesis, two parentheses, the speed reader's not going to know it's a list. And so this tool actually catches that. And it's a, hey, you should make this a list. And so again, you can do the quick fix, and you click on it, and it'll make you a list. It'll indent them as a list, which is really, 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 really great. Same thing with um, headings. They can recognize when things are being um, used for markup purposes and not headings, um, which is another major um, issue is sometimes a content editor want emphasize text to make it bigger, and they may need to each one, but that's not semantically correct. That's going to create confusion for a screen reader. If they want to make something really big, they should be new to CSS or styling. Um, because um, a screen reader listen to it in order. Um, Alright, so this is another thing that's a Duba module and it's on CK Editor. Um, I can show you again. Um, I will show you CK Editor. There we go. And it's literally this button right here. So you can see I have this whole thing. And I click on it. And that's it. And I'm just going through the whole thing. So this is my alt text. And, and that's it. Now we have alt text. It's so cool. And it's really, really been helpful on our, all of our teams. I, I think I'm going to breeze through the next few. I may be running short on time. I, Am I going backwards? No. Stage one. Um, light fixes to make sure that you are unblocking the user experience. Just get it fixed. Do the high level stuff first. And then round all the web edges. Go through those secondary elements like that about us page. The, the stuff that is not absolutely critical to the main purpose of the site. Fix later. And the stage three may be considered by de a site redesign really be visiting the user experience from the ground up. Um, and we can improve accessibility with a few equipments. Um, just be there for them. Have multiple means of communication, not just a phone call. Include chat, include forums, include email, include texting. Um, online scheduling, making appointments. Do online scheduling, not just a phone call. Um, maybe even Think about making sure that your content is searchable right there. Don't make somebody go through 10 mouse clicks to get to what they need, especially if they're thinking about somebody with Parkinson's. You may not have to have much control with the mouse. Just get them the information right up front. Caption of content. 60% of videos on Facebook are videos. And if you don't have captions on them, they're going to skip right past them. How many of you see all those tasty food videos and their captions. Do you stop on them? Because you can see them talking about it. So pay attention the next time on Facebook and see what videos capture attention versus those that don't. And those that capture attention, I'm willing to bet they're captioned versus those that are not. 
Um, it is really easy to do captions on a video. YouTube has automatic captioning. And the artificial intelligence in these tools is incredible. I've been watching this over the past four or five years, and the captioning has become incredible. And I have a blog post on how to do this. I'll tweet it out after this as a reminder. It's an incredible tool, and I encourage you to take advantage of it. You can literally, for free, use YouTube's automatic captioning algorithm, and then you can edit the text file and download the text file and upload it to your website video file. So what I do oftentimes is I create a private YouTube account and I upload all my videos to it and nobody can see it. I just download that caption file and I put it on Vimeo and other platforms. It's a pretty good hack, saves a lot of money. And it, I can do it in, in a few hours. I have to find a vendor, I to get, it's a good trick. Um, make sure that you have good error messages. Um, Make sure that, you know, instead of just colors for errors, like a box, actually add text. Because if you're colorblind, a gray outline on a gray outline is not going to help you out. Think about the touch interaction. Think about keyboard interactions, <laughs> not just a mouse interaction. Think about the context of the images. Um, don't take shortcuts, and please don't copy the alt text into the title field of an image. That's just not helpful. Um, and it's actually hurt to SEO if you do the same title of the image in the alt text field. So make them unique and distinct. Like file name 183 is not great. Um, and set up a heading, don't skip them. And I get this question a lot. Sidebar content um, it may not fall in the same heading order, but just keep them consistent throughout the site. If the sidebars are H3, make them H3 the whole site. Um, Drupal 8. The great thing about Drupal 8 and accessibility, we made this cool sweet little logo. We took their Drupal 8 and made little eyeglasses out of them. So we have buttons in the back if you want to pick up one and um, grab um, an infographic on some quick tips. So the great thing about Drupal 8 and accessibility, there's a lot of stuff out of the box. You can do skip links model. Um, the forms are accessible and they, give every, they have the um, labels in them. The alt text still require field. There's better error messages. Use a screen reader can better um, fix the errors. It's improving SEO. And we actually have an accessibility playbook that you can download for free. If you go back to my Twitter, I have a link for you there. And it has a lot of these tips and tricks. Um, so if you didn't catch all of everything I'll say at lightning speed, you can get them in the playbook. Um, and then um, remember, do it for the lowest common denominator. Just, just get it going, get it fixed. Fight for accessibility. Make, don't let somebody say it's not important. No, it matters. There's 10% of the market. It's the right thing to do. Because, you know, who wants to be left out? It's true because it's, it may affect you in 10 years. Um, it's easier to start with accessibility than you just tap it on later, like the house example I gave. Do it for the users. Do it for yourself. Do it for the lawyer. Do it for usability. And do it for SEO. And because it's the right thing to do. Any questions? Uh, thanks. Really, really thanks, guys, for coming to the last session. And I think I may literally be one minute over, so I won't be offended. But I just crammed an hour and a half into 45 minutes, so thank you for being with me. Um, and I really appreciate your attention. Um, I'll be around if you have questions. I don't want to keep you any longer, but I'll be around if you want to come up. Um, and download my playbook, and I'll be on Twitter. I have some blogs. I'll be happy to help. Thank you.